So, good afternoon and welcome to the Battle of Ideas Technology Strand debate for Everthrends negotiating online relationships. My name is Shirley Dent and I'm your chair for this discussion. Before we start, I'd like to thank our session partners, BT and the Children's Media Conference. These are organisations that care about this debate and the challenges it raises, and we are very grateful for their support. This is a debate that does exactly what it says on the tin. It's about young people forming friendships and relationships in the brave new world of social media. Phrases such as sexting, cyberbullying, flaming and trolling, grooming and digital footprint are so familiar that I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat too much into the discussion time with a long int introduction. I think there are difficult questions. How has digital and social media changed children's and young, young people's relationships? How much free reign and free expression should young people be allowed in the digital space? What is the role of adult authority in setting online boundaries? And whose authority? Parents? Moderators? Teachers? Internet service providers? Regulators? These are difficult questions and I don't think there are easy answers. This is also an audience participation event. We've got a cracking panel who I will introduce in a moment, and we very much want to hear what they have to say. But we also very much want to hear what you have to say. We want you to really engage in the spirit of the Battle of Ideas with this debate and the panel's argument. Don't be shy when it comes to the audience questions. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel in the order they are going to speak. A quick caveat on these introductions. These are all very interesting people. I'm going to give you a two-sentence introduction that won't do them justice. But please do go onto the Battle of Ideas website and catch, on the, catch up on the details that are missing here. First speaking, we have Reg Bailey. Give us a wave, Reg. Reg has been Chief Executive of the Mothers' Union, an international Christian charity with a network of over 4 million in 80, 80 countries since 1999. You can tell someone has something we might want to listen to when their name becomes shorthand for the government review they led. The Bailey Review, Letting Children Be Children, its official title, on the commercialisation and sexualisation of childhood had all 14 recommendations accepted by the government, and that was 2011? Yep. Am I right in thinking? <laughs> So I don't know about you, but I want to hear what this man has to say on this subject. Next speaking, we have Mark Goodchild, give us a wave, um, founder of the fabulously monikered Ip Dip Sky Blue, as well as an advisor to the Children's Media Conference and, men um, and member of the Executive Committee of the Children's Media Foundation. Now, Mark knows children's media, having cut his teeth on Blue Peter and record breakers, and that's evoking so many childhood <laughs> memories for me, through the first interactive BAFTA for pioneering work on walking with dinosaurs, which I loved, to the head of interactive and on demand at Children's BBC. And I know that Mark both knows and cares about the issues at the heart of this debate, and I really look forward to what he's got to say today. Next up is Dan Lloyd, give us a wave again, Dan. Um, head of, the, of Consumer Law at BT, and he's on the legal front line on many of the issues on the table here today, advising BT on the legal issues that affect BT's broadband, telephony and TV business. Daniel chairs the Internet Service Pro Providers Forum and the Business Policy Coordination Group, and is well known within BIS for his submissions on the Consumer um, Rights Bill on the future of regulation of digital content. And I'm really looking forward to the insight that Daniel brings to this discussion, particularly around thorny issues such as the role and rights, the role of rights and regulation where children and social media are concerned. And that's hopefully not putting you on the spot too much, Daniel. But I will be interested to see what you've got to say. Next, we have a true pioneer in this area, Rebecca Newton, a 20-year veteran in the online children's space and chief community and safety officer at UK-based Mind Candy, a top family digital entertainment company responsible for over 80 millions, and this, million, and this is a name some of you might recognise, Moshi Monster child accounts in 150 territories worldwide. At Mind Candy, Rebecca leads community, customer service, 
online safety, public policy, regulatory compliance, product moderation, and co content standards for game development company. But that doesn't do it justice. If you want a woman who has developed an almost intuitive understanding for what's going on with these online relationships, it's Rebecca. And this is recognised in the many speaking engagement she has worldwide wide on the issue of um, uh, children on the internet and internet safety. Last but not least, we have Mike, Mark Birkbeck, an internet, internet software and big data consultant. In Mark's own words, he is an enthusiastic frequenter of the Institute of Ideas Literature Discussions, books, book clubs and academy, having decided it's never too late to become cultivated, and perhaps one day he'll learn to play the piano. <laughs> but I also know Mark is someone with an acute interest in this subject, as both a professional geek, if that's okay to call you that, on one side, but also as a parent trying to figure this stuff out on the other. And he has some very thought-provoking and interesting thoughts to share with us today. So, let's get on with it. Reg, you have been warned. Take us away. The notes of this session talk about, the introductory notes of the session, talk about social uh, media being an indispensable and inescapable part of growing up. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. When social media passes into the mainstream, that, so that even old fogies like myself use it, it's time to recognise that it is there and it's there to stay. But actually, various services wax and wanes de depending on the cohorts that you're talking to. And just this last week, Ofcom published a very interesting study when they were looking at uh, how people used uh, media, including social media, in a particular way. Seven out of ten 12 to 15 year olds who go online now have a social media profile. And although we hear that Facebook is, is uh, slowly sort of uh, fading into obscurity, in fact, Facebook remains by far and away the most dominant of these media. Use of Instagram has doubled in the, uh, since 2013, and a significant minority of 12 to 15 year olds with a social media uh, profile use other photo or video messaging sites or apps such as Snapchat. And among those uh, 12 to 15 year olds with a pr profile, girls are much less likely to have a profile on YouTube than boys, but uh, girls will pick up on a number of different ones, particularly Instagram, Snapchat and Tumblr. What is really interesting is the gender differences. Girls seem to be much more aware that social media sites uh, can be a cause of concern particularly relating to people being bullied, spending too much time on the SAP, or friends acting thoughtlessly or hurtfully. Now, there has been a huge amount of work that's been done over the past few years by many players providing uh, advice to children and young people, with Safer Internet Day becoming a, a really good focus coordinated by the UK Safer Internet Centre. And perhaps it's due to this and other awareness raising that Ofcom revealed in this latest research that Compared with 2013, so only, only over a period of a year, children aged 12 to uh, 15 are less likely, much less likely, to say that all or most of the information that they encounter on social media sites is true. And three in four 12 to 15s who go online indicate that people behave in a different way than they uh, do when they meet people face to face. So I think there is something of a critical awareness developing in children and young people about the truthfulness of online content, as well as a level of, if you like, critical awareness of how accurately people might present themselves online. The topic of technology impacting on friendship isn't a new one. I, as I remember as a child, when we had a, our first television at home, my mum used to say, if you watch this for too long, your eyes will turn square and no one will want to speak to you. They do turn square slightly. Um, but I do think that things are cyclical, and we now see that children aged 12 to 15 spend much more time online than watching television, which is a big change, really. So social media has changed the way in which people interact. It's changed the way that people, particularly young people, express themselves and seek affirmation. And you can see that with the rise of the selfie, or the self-promoting sort of nature of social networks. But it's not always an honest account and as a pressure to keep up with social trends, or more often than not, to present a perfect image online. With updates, statuses, information being posted all the time, for many, it's, it, it, it becomes a, a priority to check their social media pages regularly, to know what's going on. 
And we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the, if you like, the daily, the hourly, or perhaps even by the minute, investment in social media? What's the cost of that to us? And I think the things that concern many onlookers is that perhaps people living on and through social media are doing so at the cost of living in the real world. So how far do we, and in particular young people, judge ourselves by what other people have to put on their social media profile? Do we find ourselves comparing our clothes, the things we're doing, and our lifestyles? And of course, this hits the headline regularly, and I think it is a headline rather than actually any depth to it. There are instances of social media being used in bullying and amplifying cruel messages, with this more often than not affecting teenagers. One of the uh, concerns I looked at in my review for the government on the commercialization and sexualization of children was the extent to which, for children and young people alike, the emphasis on assessing a young life by how that person looks or what it says undermines that person's identity. What kind of role models does it reveal to them? What does it say about relationships, about commitment, trust, and the values to which we would have them rooted in? In this session particularly, we're thinking about friendships and the value that can be taken offline and into the real world. And some of our own research at Mother's Union, the charity for which I work, show that about half of parents think that the effect of media, including the internet, makes it harder for children to create good and strong relationships with people of their own age. That's a big increase, about 7% increase since 2010. So what can be done about it, and what could parents, society, and technology providers in particular be doing in response? Well, free expression is really important. And particularly for teenagers, it's really hard for parents to intervene in what they're doing online, especially when a lot of social media interaction happens through smartphones and on the go. Parental tools and filters do have a role to play, but these and other methods of reporting and the tools provided by service cannot instill values in people. And I think that's the crucial thing I want to say. One of the, one of the things in the charity I work for, we say that our aim is to encourage loving flourishing and respectful relationships. And those values really are key here. We want to encourage parents to talk with their children about values, both online and offline, frankly, because they're important in building any sort of friendship and type of relationship. What does it mean to respect yourself online? What does it mean to respect your friends online? Thinking about the sort of pictures that are shared, comments left, the rise of cyberbullying, and the transmission of, of sexual imagery, so-called sexting. Who can you trust online? Are you trustworthy online and offline with the things your friends share with you? And identity, that's a key question about do we know who we're really speaking to or gaming with online? I'm really interested in the discussion we have today, but there are five things I want to bear in mind as we begin. First, I think we need to be careful not to dismiss the very meaningful relationships that children and young people have formed online. Secondly, I think, how can we champion the times and the instances where people are using social media positively and share their voice rather than simply highlighting the times when it goes pear-shaped? And thirdly, I think there need to be really effective and readily available tools for anyone using social media to use should the need arise, and they need to be constantly revised and updated as changes happen. And fourthly, social media providers need to continually revise how they're protecting users and the tools that they provide. And finally, and to my mind most importantly of all, we need to empower young people to be able to form good friendships, to use their own emotional intelligence to develop that in a robust uh, way. So that that's both offline and online. And that means thinking as a society, what are our value systems? What do we really show as important? Thank, Thank you, Raj. Um, Flosh and Lovin, I like that. So my background is a practitioner and have, over the last four or five years, worked uh, across multiple uh, products designed for children. And I'm going to take up, pick up a bit, little bit from where Reg has, has started, but probably aiming much younger. So my, the stuff that I've done over the years has been working on brands like Horrible Histories, um, working at Children's BBC on both CBBS and CBBC, and primarily my line is about how do you make sure that what we're making today for children, and children I make the cut off at 12 before they become teens, how do we make sure that tomorrow's 12, 13, 14 year old when they're getting to secondary school and they're starting to use social media you know, 
with their eyes shut, how do we make sure that they're equipped for that, sort of those stepping stones? And I do think it's a sort of a transition which we've never really had to face before um, as practitioners and people who make stuff. Um, and it is interesting when we talk about social media, what that means at different ages. Uh, social media, in a sort of a grown-up sense, tends to focus around the Facebooks, Snapchats you mentioned, uh, stuff that we uh, are posting our life on online and, and sharing. <coughs> Whereas younger children don't particularly, uh, before they're about nine or ten, aren't so bothered about sharing everything that they do, what they've eaten for breakfast, um, what they, what they, uh, who they're sitting next to on the bus. But they are sharing stuff through other platforms which you might or might not consider social media platforms. And the biggest by far is YouTube. YouTube is huge with the under 10s. Um, it's the most popular website in the UK and has this bizarre, uh, ambiguous relationship with its audience that, in its terms and conditions, doesn't say whether it's appropriate for children or not. Um, so my view over the last three or four years has been very much how do we make stuff with, for children, with children in mind. But I don't think actually the real, that's where the problem is. If you go to the, the, all the big broadcasters, they're doing amazing stuff. You've got Moshi Monsters doing amazing stuff, and they know how to make stuff with their audience in mind. They understand the uh, developmental stages that children are at at the different ages. They know how to ask questions in a sort of proper, clear English point of view, so that you're not trying to trick them into signing up to something that they didn't know. The bigger issue is that the uh, institutions and technologies that we all, as adults, are entrusting our lives to, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, none of those, in my mind, are really taking children seriously. And that was fine when children weren't on those platforms. <coughs> but children are going to those platforms in their masses. And I don't even think that's wrong. You know, children are emulating what their parents are doing. If we think it's good enough for them, why shouldn't children be allowed to watch great clips on YouTube? Why shouldn't they be able to get music from iTunes? But with that power of distribution comes a real responsibility, which I think the big institutions now need to face up to. And the reason it's changing is because of the rise of these. Uh, in the Ofcom report, a third of children, 5 to 15, now have their own tablet. So the days when we used to say, but parents should take more responsibility and keep an eye on everything that they're doing, which used to be the rule about television. You have the TV in the corner of the room, a parent could look over your shoulder. We sort of knew that they weren't going off into dark territories because it was still on, you could hear it. You can't do that. We, know it's, we, we, we all know the, the idea of being able to see every page, every button you're clicking is just impossible. So in the last three years, I'd say I've shifted my opinion from saying we need more tools for parents, because I actually think there are lots of tools for parents now. And I think we need to shift further into where do we stand as a society on all of this? Because it's not just about parents <coughs> equipping their kids. Hopefully most parents do. We know from Ofcom regularly they say that actually most parents feel that they don't quite know as much as their children do, so more education is needed. But it's more about how do you make these platforms safe. Safe and appropriate for what they're intended. And in the real world, we have quite a lot of examples where we do that already. So we had rules, uh, BBFC, around films. We, so, and we told our kids, you're not allowed to go and see an under-18 uh, 18 18 film because you're too young. But we also expected the cinema owners not to sell those tickets to the children when they turned up. It's actually illegal and it's a, an offence. Mm -hmm. And when, in the days when there were video stores, we'd, we, uh, I expected the video stores not to uh, rent out movies to underage kids. Similarly, if you were building a, motor, a new road system near a school, you would expect the contractors to think about making sure there's extra provision for children to cross the road near the school. And I know Reg touched on this in his report about sexualization. Where there are bus stops near schools, uh, one of the things that you uh, suggested that there shouldn't be sec advertising which was overtly sexual because it just doesn't make sense. And yet, year by year, these things creep. We go to Westfield, Victoria's Secrets is about two stores down from the Disney store. Does it matter? Well, I think it probably does because I think what we're doing is we're genu generally lowering the standard. And I've, when I mentioned 
uh, YouTube, and it's, this isn't to single YouTube out, but it is interesting that even the big children's broadcasters are now setting up channels on YouTube because they know that's where children are. The BBC, Children's BBC has a channel, Disney, Sesame Street this week announced that they were doing stuff on YouTube. And yet YouTube isn't completely designed with children in mind. You can get erroneous <laughs> ads coming from left, right and centre. You go onto Sesame Street, you can still use the global search bar and go to anywhere else on YouTube. And that's where I think all the institutions who reach children now have a bigger obligation to try and put children first. And what I'd like to see, and this is sort of my own view, is that actually we should start in imploring on these companies to have a children's policy alongside a data policy, alongside a disabilities policy, so that they actually say what measures they take to put children first. And if they're, not in the in, if they're not interested in a children's audience, that's fine. But then put up bigger gates to stop them getting in in the first place. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to go and check out the Sesame Street <laughs> YouTube channel. Um, responsibilities, policies, over to Daniel and BT. My name's Daniel. I work at BT. I just want to start off today by making really one point, and that's that BT takes child safety online very seriously. And we do a number of things to help parents work out ways of making sure their children stay safe online. But at the same time, I want to emphasise that, I, I think in difference to what Mark was saying, uh, there is no, ultimately, there is no substitute for good parenting. There's no way around the fact that good parenting is the best solution to working through how children deal with online content and work out a positive way of understanding what they're seeing online and understanding how they interact with it. Um, but we'll just take that question for one moment in terms of what children can access online. It's undoubtedly the case that uh, there's been a radicalisation of content online over the last, uh, over the last five or six... Well, th there's a rad radicalisation of content online and within social media platforms that maybe wasn't there in the past. And it's possible for children with unfiltered access to obviously gain access to all sorts of stuff that you would not want them to be having access to in an unfiltered context. You can't deny the fact that it's very easy to get a hold of all sorts of obscene and extreme internet pornography. It'd be very easy to get hold of stuff that's going on in Syria and Afghanistan, which you wouldn't want children to be looking at. And again, in the social media context, it's very, again, it's very important to recognise the, how damaging trolling can be to children online and how damaging cyberbullying can be. But there's people on this platform far more qualified to talk about uh, that than I am. I don't want to really indulge in those areas. But it's important to recognise how easy it is for children to access that kind of material and to recognise, therefore, how important it is to put in place certain measures to facilitate and help parents prevent that from happening. So in that sense, BT has a range of tools available through parental controls to ensure that parents have the tools at their disposal, and the emphasis is on parental controls, to regulate and control their child's access to the internet. BT is not alone in taking that view. All the four ISPs, Sky, Virgin Media, TalkTalk, Talk, have a similar range of controls, which have constantly been updated, I take your point, because children tend to be very clever and work out ways around that, and how you're constantly innovating those controls to make sure they do what they say on the tin in terms of setting up certain categories of content categories of content which children can't access is an ongoing battle. But it's very important that that tool is made available and those tools are made available to uh, parents so that parents have the best possible control over uh, how their children are accessing content online. And to that end, those four ISPs have had a major initiative to set up something called inter internetmatters.org uh, where you can find lots of information on child safety more generally and lots of information about how, as a parent, you may want to have certain questions about how child safety works and how you can have certain tools to make sure that you're comfortable that your children have the kind of access to the internet that you want them to have. Interesting point, just say, I think the social media platforms are probably slightly behind where the ISPs are. So the ISPs have been doing that for some years. Um, if you look at Facebook and Twitter there, I wouldn't say they're completely new to that game, but they've come to that game a little bit later in terms of working out what the right kind of level of control is. But the real point I want to make is that's still no substitute for good parenting. So by way of anecdote, I've got a friend who's a lawyer. He's got four kids, and he talks about his 18-year-old daughter and says, um, he made, makes a point to me, he's got no problem with the way that she uses the internet. They've had a number of conversations about the internet. He's very comfortable with the way that she uses it. She has a number of different online uh, profiles, so to speak, in terms of social media platforms. She's very grown up, very mature. Uh, he feels like he's done a good job as a parent, um, and he feels very comfortable with the way that she interacts with the internet. Uh, his 13-year-old son, on the other hand, he is already stealing himself for the conversation around how does he talk to his 13-year-old son about internet porn and, and the fact that his son will obviously want to start looking at all this stuff very soon. And that's a difficult question for any parent to have, but that is the point about being a parent. It's all about how do you have that conversation with your children 
and then how do we, within the industry, make sure that you have all the tools at your disposal to be able to make sure you have the right sorts of conversations <coughs> with your children in terms of how you access content online. That was basically reaffirmed in a report this week by the Oxford Internet Institute, and they came to the three following conclusions looking at how children online access the internet. And they make the following points in their conclusions. Children who have positive offline relationships with their parents are more likely to navigate the web in a sensible way. Supportive and enabling parenting has a more positive impact than restricting or monitoring internet use. And teenagers left to self-regulate their internet and social media use are much more likely to teach themselves new skills online and maintain positive online relationships. Now, that's an important point that's been made here. It's all about how do parents make sure their children, as they develop, as they grow up, as they become adults, have a positive interaction with the internet as teenagers. And in that context, how do you give them more freedom to interact and then make sure you have those kind of conversations that you need to have with them as children, as teenagers, as they develop? And I think my fear is if we try and go beyond providing parents with those tools, providing parents with the tools to be able to have those kind of conversations with their children, we might end up in a situation where we cross over from facilitating good parenting to policing access to the internet. And an internet service provider is a provider of access to the internet. Most ISPs, all ISPs, do not want to be in a position where they're policing access to the internet. And as a society, we should really ask ourselves the question, do we really want ISPs to be having more control over uh, people's access to the internet than they do at the moment? Surely the right approach is giving parents control over how their kids use the internet and thereby facilitating a good relationship between parent and child rather than stepping further into that. So I was interested in the point you were making, but I'm not sure practically or in principle where that would take you or where you would go. So just take one example. When you talk about uh, the old film classification idea, would we really want websites to be classified by reference to 18, 15 PG? I know the kids I know would probably, as soon as they saw it was 18, jump onto it. A bit like when I was a kid watching Channel 4 and I saw the yellow triangle on the TV screen, I would start watching it immediately. So practically speaking, it's a question of, um, for me, facilitating good parenting and recognising that there's no, there's no substitute for good parenting and also understanding that do you really want ISPs to have that kind of role to play in society in the way that the internet access could be policed? Because once you start stepping into those areas, it's another kind of political discussion which may not be the place, well, maybe this is a place to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But we should understand in that context then that there has been a number of very big political discussions between industry and government over the last two or three years where uh, government is putting more and more pressure on ISPs. So, for example, parental controls now are default turned on. Um, and that was a conversation that the ISPs weren't particularly happy to go with, but BT and the rest have gone with that approach, we think it may be possibly illegal, uh, but the government basically took everyone behind a closed door and said we want you to default turn parental controls on even for adults. So at some point in the future you'll have to opt out of parental controls even for you as an adult. And the difficulty with that approach is that kind of patronises and inter intervenes one step further than maybe we should be in relation to how the internet, uh, in terms of policing people's own access to the internet and casting all adults as children. Okay. Don't agree with that. <laughs> I, 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 I can see a really interesting discussion opening up here already. Just to be absolutely clear, this is the place to have those <laughs> political and public discussions. From policing to moderation, Rebecca, over to you. I'm Rebecca Newton. I'm the Chief Community and Safety Officer for Mind Candy. I've had about 20 years in this space, starting at AOL, going to Habbo. I was, at, I was in charge of 24 countries in the community in moderation at Habbo Hotel until 2007 when I joined Mind Candy and we launched Moshi Monsters uh, soon after I joined. And now we have a social network for kids called Pop Jam. It's sort of taking over England by storm and it's fantastic and I'm the person that's going to talk about all the great stuff that kids and young people do online. I'm not as concerned about the online world as I am about the offline world, but, th but this is about the online world. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview of my 20 years of being in the space and seeing what's come in terms of moderation, in terms of public policy online, in terms of children's policy. I love Mark's idea about a child policy. I think that's a responsible thing to do. And about what we do in terms of moderation and finding the balance between somebody having fun, because how much fun is it to have somebody attached to your side when you're trying to hang out with friends and have an adult watching everything that you do? We've built pretty advanced software and worked with um, a British company called Crisp Thinking and a Canadian company called Two Hat Security in creating, uh, helping each other create software that monitors behavior and scales. So how do you monitor 70,000 kids? Think about sending 70,000 kids to Hyde Park and saying just press this red button 
in case you have a problem, it's not really effective. So we've spent many years building up software that alerts us to something that we decide, and I know that's subjective, but we, what we think, and basically what I think, based on my um, experience, is, is something that needs to be flagged up and is important. We're not busy running around after kids who maybe swear or, you know, maybe have a bad sense of humor, but we are um, busy looking at relationships that might not be healthy uh, or behavior that's going to become unhealthy. And we can now predict behavior based on 20 years of chat and a million chat lines a month, et cetera. The human moderators uh, are become behavior management experts, basically, by watching online behavior. We can tell an emotion online based on how somebody types, the speed at which they type, whether they pause in between words, what emoticons they use, and what words they choose. Much like you can offline when you, it's not quite as effective, I'm sure, but we would argue that we are just as adept at, at understanding the, be, the behavior behind a text line or a graphic. And then what do kids do online? Well, from my perspective, again, from many years of watching kids online, and now that we have graphics and they can, they can a picture's worth a thousand words. So the first thing that I've noticed over the years is that they, the first thing they do is to form relationships. It's the very first objective. I've, I've gotten online. I need to find my tribe. I need to create my tribe, or I need to try different tribes. And so they form relationships They make by making new friends. Uh, the, the train that left the station many years ago of don't do that. Don't talk to anybody you don't know. It's just not going to happen, just like in the offline world. When they go to school, they don't talk. They don't say, oh, I'm not going to talk to anybody I don't know, because if, if it's kindergarten or first grade, you don't know anybody. So you have to you, you have to just it's just human instinct and human nature to want to connect with each other. Kids don't have the barriers that we gain as we get older and want to connect right away. So they create social circles of friends. Some of them are offline, some of them are new friends online, some of them are international. At Habbo, when there was just one Habbo hotel and it was based in the UK, there was a little one in Finland in the early days, but the big one was in the UK and it was international. The whole point, when we started opening up Habbo hotels in different countries, it, the, the original hotel, they had a culture that they had built that was international, and we sort of messed around with that culture by trying to separate kids by IP address. You can only go in here if you're from the US, or you can only go in here if you're from France. And we argued that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to spread into 24 countries, that they wanted that international culture. They built a culture. So, Young people build cultures online, and people try them out just like they do offline. Some people go, you know, are into punk music. Some people are into pop music. I mean, it's the same situation. So they're looking for an identity, and part of that experience is going online and trying different identities. The thing that we're most interested in, at, excuse me, at Mind Candy, is children or young people showing off their skills, finding their thing, what do I do? So in Pop Jam, they have the, the, the tools to, to just take a photo or use photos from the net of maybe somebody's into shoes and really into shoes, and they just post all these shoes and people start following them because they want to see, wonder what kind of shoes they're putting up on the net today. Or maybe they're into drawing or photography, or maybe they're into Lego or Minecraft. We have a lot of Minecraft young people on, on Pop Jam. And there's just something for everybody, and everybody gets to shine. And that's one of the things I think is so attractive about YouTube, is that everybody wants to be a YouTube video star, everybody. And they see what's happening. I think that's important. The two, if we had a word cloud of everything that everybody has said over the last 20 years, of between ages 7 and 12, from, from where I've worked, it's, the first thing is always high. And the second thing is either add me, friend me, follow me. And that's what we're seeing now at Pop Jam. It's follow me, follow me, follow me. I have 100 followers. I have 1,000 followers. Follow me, follow me. Hi, hi, hi. Who are you? Where are you from? So we can't stop sharing personal, personally identifying information, but we can contain it and monitor it. And that's what we do. And um, 
I'm just going to zip way ahead to the end of my page and say, <laughs> I think um, we have a responsibility as a as industry and moderators and and people in the space to to be role models. It's not our job to parent at someone else's children, just like in the offline world, we wouldn't do that. But it is our responsibility to be role models and provide creative, healthy places for self-expression and really uh, celebrate how amazing young people are and how creative they are. And um, it does take a village and we don't wanna be a parent, but we definitely wanna be part of the experience of shaping uh, or providing tools for young people to find who they are in this world online and offline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark. Um, okay, thank you very much. Some great uh, points already emerging. I wanna kind of leap in and respond to them straight away and skip over the introduction, but I won't. Um, so I'm sure you already know this, but the internet is a very strange place. And the reason I think it's a strange place is because it's uh, not really a public place, a public space in the way that we would normally think about it, and it's not really a private space uh, in the way that we'd normally think about a private space. Senate, in a, in a, um, a really interesting book called The um, uh, Fall of Public Man, he was talking about cities, and he said, um, the city should be a forum in which it becomes meaningful to join with other persons without the compulsion to know them as persons. And you could say that that's a description of what a public space is. A public space is where we can kind of interact with each other without knowing. Most of you here, hardly anybody here will have met me before. I, I don't know anybody here, pretty much. But we're interacting with each other in a public space where we don't know each other. We have a sort of anonymity. And we're going to interact, hopefully, on the basis of what we say um, and the arguments that we put forward, rather than uh, you know, whether we uh, kicked the dog this morning, if you have a dog, um, or a virtual dog that you didn't feed, maybe you should be at home feeding it. Um, there, there's a kind of anonymity. This public space is about us interacting with each other. But the internet isn't really a public space in that sense. You can't be anonymous. You've probably seen this fuss at the moment. The drag queens uh, on Facebook are not allowed to uh, have anonymous names. They have to... Um, uh, Facebook is, has got this policy in order to tackle bullying and uh, hate speech and that kind of thing of people have to indicate who they really are. Whisper, you've probably seen this um, thing, there's a, an online service where you can put comments over a picture from anywhere in the world uh, and The Guardian announced that they were no longer going to work with Whisper because it's turned out that you can actually track uh, people and work out where they are even if they've said please don't track me. So it's very difficult to be um, anonymous on the internet, so that means it's not a public space in the way that we would uh, talk about it, that you know about uh, people being trolled, you say something on the internet, people leap on it. It's not a forum for discussion in the way that you would normally think about a, a public space. It's not Speaker's Corner where you can just turn up and have a, have a dialogue and anonymity. So you can only be anonymous if Google and Facebook and these other, and the ISPs that uh, Dan talked about allow you to be. So it's, it's not a, a public space in, in the way that you would say, but it's also not a private space because a private space is, is where you kind of interact with your family, you say the odd dumb thing over dinner and uh, you, know, you get forgiven for it. Um, maybe you do something silly when you're young and you know, your gran has a word with you about it, but then it's kind of forgotten over the history. You know, maybe it's remembered at Christmas uh, in the family. But really, it's a private space where you can kind of learn to, to grow up and you can uh, you know, work out how you interact with the world and maybe have your first drink and all this kind of thing. But it's not a private space in that sense because although we put private things onto the internet, they're there for everybody to see. So it's a kind of uh, a chimera space. It's a, it's a strange amalgam of public and private. What ends up happening is your private persona gets dragged into this public world uh, for everybody to see. And I think that's not a problem of technology. I think that's a problem of the fact that we have lost that distinction. Just about everywhere you turn, uh, we have lost the desire to keep these two worlds separate. We've kind of merged the two. We don't see, and when I want to say we, I'm talking here about adults now. So it's hardly surprising that young people uh, are kind of using this technology to, to, to throw everything out there, when actually um, <laughs> you know, most, of, most of the time adults are, are doing exactly the same thing. Now, I read something recently where people would argue that it's the technology 
that has led to this. Because we have this technology, this is why we're all acting in this way. We're unable to keep our photos in our pockets and you know, you know, we have to share them all, all the time. But um, I was struck a few weeks ago watching, um, do you remember the film, the older ones here, Jerry Maguire? And uh, we were looking for a film to watch with the kids, so we dug Jerry Maguire out. And that's a film made in 1996, and one of the running jokes in that film is the way everybody was hugging each other and crying and, and about how the emotion of the athletes was sort of uh, the thing that you were supposed to judge them by. Um, and it's kind of a running joke through the film. And obviously it was, that was early days in all of that kind of sharing your emotion and putting it all out there. Facebook doesn't start till 2004. So I would argue that, you know, we kind of get the technology we deserve. This is the technology people want. To, to share themselves online. But of course the genie is now out of the bottle, there's no way this is, we're not going to turn this back, it's here to stay. So I'm think, thinking, as, as you said at the beginning, I've got children, you know, so how do I approach this? I think that we do talk about the distinction between the public world in, in which you want to do things like conferences like this, talking, debates, politics, and the private, keeping back part of your world so I don't see the best thing that we can do for, for children is simply about cookies and teaching them the intricacies and the minutiae of, uh, of uh, setting their browser correctly, or even necessarily getting too obsessed with sexting and online bullying. I think that we, um, we need to really try and draw attention to, pe uh, to, to, to young people and to ourselves about what it is that we're losing when we merge these two worlds and then hope that the technology and the way we use the technology will follow. I mean, certainly, to finish, I think the idea of Moshi Monsters being a kind of minority report where, for kids, you know, where you can tell who's <coughs> going to commit a crime before they've even committed it based on algorithms that are being developed. I'll certainly be suggesting to my children that they don't get involved in that. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it's frightening. Um, and I think it's, it's frightening not because of anything that you might do with it in its detail, but it's frightening about the way that we're kind of just sleepwalking into this, this kind of uh, uh, sanitization, using the technology to blur, uh, to blur these lines. So I think that's it, yeah. So it's the blurring of these two worlds, and I think talking to, to ourselves, trying to get to grips with that, and then trying to encourage our kids to take the same uh, uh, slightly cynical approach about this technology. Thank you. Can we just uh, thank the panel for those introductions? <laughs> I've got to say, as you can see, there are already arguments on the table. I've got three questions, which I'm going to throw out across the panel rather than individually before I come out to you guys. And I want to take Mark's point about the strangeness of these worlds, the online and offline, particularly the, the online world. And also refer back to Reg's point at the beginning about our relationships have been changed. The way we engage with the world, and I remember sitting around the box, the black and white TV and the box, and that was your interaction with, your, with the world and your family. How different are these worlds? Are we overstating the boundary between the online and offline world? Is something else going on here? And what about the private and public um, sense that young people, who've grown up with Facebook, have of themselves and those relationships. I'm really interested in whether young people we call digital natives actually do have a different sense of relationships and friendships. The 1,000 people who are my friend, <laughs> is it different or are we overstating it or is there something else going on? Anybody who'd like to jump in? I'll, I'll kick off on that. There's definitely a generational point, which is uh, people my age I'm in my mid-40s, and probably a lot younger down to maybe their 30s. I think probably use Facebook as a way of staying in touch with people that you've known and met in the offline world. Mm. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't think I have many friends who are just purely online, where when I speak to my nephews, it's very clear they have lots of friends who they've never met, but with whom they consider they have meaningful relationships, which is a purely online relationship they have. Uh, which is a very interesting phenomenon for me to get my head around that. Can I just ask, is it necessarily a bad thing, though? No, it's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I, I think it's a really positive thing because it allows for you to have a, a relationship with people who you would, uh, in an analogue world, never, ha never have had the chance to have that relationship with. And for me, I think a really good thing about that is that if you take Mark's way of looking at it, I would see it more as just a way to extend your private life to a much bigger place and involve many more people in your private sphere and have a meaningful relationship with them in your private sphere, in your private world even though that has a much more of a public quality to it than it had previously. So to give an example, 
I spoke to a friend at work about something that was on her Facebook page, and she was upset and said, Dan, that was a private thing, that was on my Facebook page. I'm her Facebook friend, and the point she was making was, work is public, Facebook is, well, I talk about myself privately in terms of things I enjoy doing. You shouldn't really be bringing that into the office here, which is a really interesting insight, because it's, mm -hmm. it's true, if you think about it like that, what, what goes on in Facebook, well, hopefully stays on Facebook, but the point is that it does allow you to have a number of relationships online, which uh, traditionally, 30 years ago, would have been a private conversation at pub, and now it's a private conversation with many more individuals, but it has an online character to it. But I still think I would categorise it more as private than public. Mark, you want to come in? We talk, we're talking about social media, and it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's this exponential uh, uh, change on both the social and the media. You know, that's the big difference that this generation have. When we were kids, you could only watch TV. You could only watch con get content through TV. It was we have a watershed. We're 50 years of the watershed. <coughs> you have um, pin, protect pin protection. It was unlikely you were going to trip over stuff that wasn't appropriate for you. Um, now there is just so much content out there, and without some of it's restricted, some of it has sort of limitations on it, and some of it doesn't. So children have access to. You know, more media than they have hours in their day, and therefore, um, you know, then becomes about how do you filter it. And uh, and in the same way, in the past, they only had a certain number of people in their class, 30 kids. They meet some kids in the park. We did a whole bit of work when I was at Children's BBC about social graph of children, and they do have different types of friends. They have the friends who they know from class. They're not they're friends who would come to their birthday party, but they're not their best friends. There's another bunch of friends who they might know from the park who they don't even know their names, but they're good enough to play football with. So kids had these different worlds, and I think that's fine. What's happened here is this, this is just exponential connections. And if we are coming back to the point about, you know, the parents, good parenting can put that all back in the bottle. You can't control exponential connections, and you can't control exponential media. No parent has a chance to sit on all of that. And therefore, we either expect kids to take on all of that responsibility or someone else has to start No, I think it's, it's Miss... Oh, okay. No, no, no. Did, Rebecca, did you want to come in? Uh, I just agree with Mark that I think it's... The, the train left the station there, too. It's just exponentially too big It's to, to try to make any one person responsible for that, but I think it takes the industry to be responsible for that. I just want to say, I think it, it's terribly easy to just offload this as a parental responsibility, and because I think that's desperately unfair. We, we blame parents for almost everything. And I think that's desperately unfair. I actually think we have a wider societal responsibility. Um, just as if you if 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 you went to the park with your children, and you saw your you saw another kid getting involved in a fight, I hope you would step in, whether the and you wouldn't say well they're not my children, so I'm not going to deal with that. I mean we we have a sort of societal responsibility for dealing with things, and I think that's something that we very easily forget in in this. We can. Well, and, and I, you know, I think regulators have a part to play. I think the ISPs have a part to play. I think interesting what you said about um, the legality of the ISP is talking about um, uh, talking about whether or not they they should have put parental filters on by default because the mobile industry had done that already, mm. and most of which was owned by the ISP. So I find it it's interesting how we we sort of can so far get caught into our box that we forget what we're looking at. And I think it is a much wider, you know, it's a societal responsibility, really. Uh, I'll tell you the point. The, the point I'm making is that it's a question of working collaboratively with parents and helping parents to do that. But once, as you say, the genie's out of the bottle, exponential connections, kids are exposed to much more stuff than my generation could ever have been exposed to in terms of connections with humans around the planet on a whole range of issues. And then obviously, therefore, subject to other forms of abuse, cyberbullying, etc., etc. In my day, it was just putting the playground that still goes on and they have cyberbullying. So I think in that context, it's important to say in the spirit of partnership and friendship with parents, saying to parents, give all the tools that they could possibly require to help them uh, monitor and control their kids' access to the internet, but also take on board what the Oxford Internet Institute have come up with, which is to say, actually, if you give children the freedom to interact with online, they will develop and develop their own way, their own tools, their own social mechanisms and tools to deal with online content and in that context which have faith in people's ability as they grow up with a good, healthy, supportive parenting to work out for themselves how to have an online relationship, which is pos uh, online experience which is positive. There's something to be said there because young people have kind of, to some extent, moved online in order to get away from the fact that um, uh, parents are constantly watching what they do all the time. Um, so we kind of created this strange situation where we'd much rather they were at home than out and about 
you know, mixing it up with the rough kids or whatever <laughs> in the local area. But then when they come home, we then immediately want to know what they're doing all the time in their bedrooms and we want to uh, monitor. So I think you're right. I think this, this point about just, just letting kids be kids uh, is quite important. And somehow we have to find a way to do that online without obsessing and doing what Reg is talking about. I, I, you're right that society has a responsibility and I certainly agree with you the whole park scenario, you'd want that. But that isn't unfortunately what happens. That doesn't, when you then try and move that up a level to say, oh, society has a responsibility to protect children online, that becomes legislation. It becomes, uh, you can only access this uh, service if you agree to all of these guidelines, and that becomes completely different to the sort of the friendly uh, person. We sign up to lots of other guidelines, though. We sign our lives away to our ISP guidelines. So, you know, I don't think that that's the sort of, we've got to, you know, we are, as adults, signing away to all sorts of things, and most of it's hidden. Most of it's mm -hmm. not out there. With kids, I think there's an interesting thing, is that there's no doubt that Snapchat came about because it was children or teens responding to the fact that they didn't, they're pretty savvy today's teens. They don't want their silly They've picture to, they don't want their silly picture to haunt them in years to come. So they all went on to Snapchat. <clears throat> and then lo and behold, actually Snapchat does store your history. <laughs> and you know, it's that transparency, which is, I think, which is missing. And unless we force people, we, we hold people to account to be more transparent about the services, then you're not gonna get the change. This, I, I wanna leave this question about policies and regulations and guidelines just hang in there and perhaps take that out to the audience and do give us your thoughts and have a bit more of a discussion on that as the debate goes on. I'm going to limit myself to one more question to the, the panel before we go out to you guys, but it's one that's come up in the discussion we've just had. And it's Rebecca's point about it takes a village. And it's the intergenerational point, which I'm also interested in, about interaction online between, not just with young people, but young people with people of all ages. And Reg, you, you gave the example of if there were two kids in the park having a bit of a ding dong, you'd step in as an adult. Is there not also in the climate of society we live in a fear of approaching children because of the whole yes. panic, <clears throat> and I say that advisedly, around strange danger, which is even written larger online. So I'd just like to have the panel's thoughts about <laughs> not just kids in their own blessed space online, but actually intergenerational interaction online and I know that Moshi Monster has never barred adults and Pop Jan doesn't bar adults from joining so I'm quite interested in that and this idea that it takes the village. We noticed at Moshi that a lot of grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles were interacting with their grandchildren or children or it was something they could share with between families and distant family members um, who didn't, if their grands didn't live in the same area uh, and there was, they just felt like it was something they could do with their kids. And because we monitor the minority report um, version of monitoring um, behavior, uh, um, we didn't feel like that was a problem. And it's also not a natural world to be in a world where only people your age are, and you should never look at anybody or talk to anybody outside your age group. I don't think that's normal, and I don't think it's um, a, a great way to teach young people how to navigate in a world full of lots of different people. So we had, we, we have um, pretty strict guidelines about how people can interact and, and we know um, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and have worked that into our software too. So, um. <laughs> Any other thoughts, thoughts on that from the panel? Yeah, I'd, I'd come back to this point about do you step in and do we get worried about parents? I think we do always worry about how people are going to react because we don't have, we, we've sort of in some senses lost track of our value system. Um, and I think that the best thing, the best filters you can apply, the best moderation you can apply in this whole environment is to have emotionally resilient young people. Mm -hmm. And that's about creating values. I hate to use the phrase family values because it all, it's got, it's a sort of loaded <laughs> phrase, but I, I think there are senses in which um, instilling values in ourselves as adults, in the way that we treat other people, are, uh, you know, it's the, one of the most quickly transferred things to children and young people. And if you do that, actually, it doesn't really matter what the environment, the online environment's like, you've started to create those values. So if, if for example, you don't stand within a family for bullying, then actually your children won't stand for cyberbullying. They'll, they'll, they'll point that out with other people. Um, the, if, if you think, is that a really kind way of speaking to people? 
then actually, you know, very quickly, children and young people learn that. And I think, to me, the biggest idea that you can pull out of this is, is to forget this artificial distinction between the various worlds and say, let's behave properly, let's teach values, let's model those values ourselves, and actually the children will follow. And you will, of course, you're going to get half a percent, one percent of people who don't buy, <coughs> buy by that. But actually, the important thing is how we model it ourselves in the first place. Any quick thoughts before... I'm very keen to get out, so any very quick thoughts from anybody else on the panel on this issue? OK, I'm coming out to you guys. Don't be shy. I can see some hands already. I'm 26, OK? I remember going on to an internet re relay chat uh, client when I was about 9 or 10 and talking to all sorts of people I shouldn't have been. But I think the thing that I keep hearing is this is, this is, this is not a new problem. This is a problem that is as old as the internet. And I feel like I need to reiterate that Filters don't work. I'm glad you mentioned that that parental control. It doesn't control anything. It's a, it's a political censorship tool. It's not. I mean, I know this because you just talk to a 12-year-old. You ask him to find a picture of someone being beheaded, and he'll find it quite happily, no matter what filters or parental controls are on here. And I feel like everybody, collectively, is missing a very huge elephant in the room, which is there are, un there are online communities that children interact with parents may not know about or parents may not be competent to deal with. And I'm talking like f things like uh, LGBT communities, self-harm, suicide, religion. All of, all of those communities are out there and children interact with them. And I think it's very interesting that no one has actually mentioned that. And it, I, think, I think Greg has sort of actually hit the nail on the head almost. I mean, children are not incompetent. I speak, speak as somebody who's been a child and someone who has <laughs> interacted with numerous numbers of children. Children are very competent and they are able to utilize that technology in a way that I don't think, I don't, and I'm not sure is necessarily being appreciated. I mean, children will access those communities and I think the important thing is to actually empower children to be able to deal with that. You said that good parenting was one of the best ways to keep children safe on the internet. But if you look at adverts, um, they show virus protection and uh, softwares, but very, very rarely do they sh show websites and like uh, courses where parents can actually go and learn about things like how, how to keep their kids safe, so I was wondering if what you would like to say about that. Um, I think it's worth distinguishing between the two different um, types of problem that we're addressing here. One, I would argue, is the creation of the child protection industry itself, the discussion about sexting and cyberbullying. You know, the, the extent to, that, to which that's a problem is, I would argue, quite marginal. It's kind of been blown out of all proportion, in my view. You've got another problem around that the Mark uh, on, the, on the left here was talking about, where content is made available for cultural reasons, with this kind of meshing of the public and private, which has created problems that weren't there before. The kind of access to you know, ISIS videos or access to hard porn, the sorts of problems that parents wouldn't have had to deal with in the past. And that does create a problem, but I don't think the kind of regulatory approach is gonna work. I think even BT have probably gone too far. You know, BT aren't parenting experts. No. In the end, it has to be down to parents themselves. Yes. to actually address this problem. So there's no easy solution to that, but I think putting in place more controls, however light touch they may be, isn't going to solve the problem. If you ask young people what they actually get up to on the internet and who they talk to, uh, and I did this with an anonymous survey uh, with a uh, couple of classes, uh, the most popular person they talk to, using any tool they, they can get their hands on, is mum. Not dad, though. <laughs> No, no, they don't speak to dad. But so, so basically what they're doing is replicating the relationships that they already have online, in the main, okay? And I think that th that tells you that what we're dealing with is relationships between adults and children anyway. And then the, the point about the way we relate to things like sexting and all the rest of it is that that's adults relating to their children in that way. And then it's no surprise then that we problematise the very relationships we've got with them through that means. So it's not that it's the technology is that our relationship with uh, young people is, is taking that form through technology and we're, we're making it much more difficult to deal with those issues. So if you mentioned bullying uh, and cyberbullying, that's much worse because it must be, surely. 
not because you can't deal with it, but it must be more complicated because it's on the internet. And I don't think it is. It's just the way we respond to it. So we're going to have to be a bit quick. There's lots in there. There's risk and regulation, what parents know, what parents don't know. Anybody want to dive in? Yeah. Reg, dive in. Yeah, I think, I, th I think I'd like to pick up the point about parental controls. I think they have their place, and they can do some useful filtering for some younger people. The problem is if parents tend to think that parental controls absolve them from any responsibility because they're perfect, then they're in for a big shock because, as you've said, they're not. It, it does occur to me that in, in parental terms... Um, one of the things that often happens is, is, in my experience, is that a lot of parents blame the technology and say, well, we're not as familiar with the technology, so we can't engage with our children about it, when actually technology just becomes a cover for not wanting to talk to their children about some of those issues that you described, the elephant in the room. Parents do not, on average, want to talk to their kids about pornography, and their perception of pornography is filtered and is, is fastened in the past when they may have encountered what they regard as pornography and it's certainly not what's out there now and so actually they worry and they hide behind the technology and say well the kids are much more t the kids are much more tech savvy than we are well in reality it's just a way of excusing not having that conversation obviously i agree parental controls are not perfect and they're constantly evolving and young people always find as they get a bit older ways around them and uh, I acknowledge the point, and there's a constant debate within industry, how do you improve that so that parents have, do have the power uh, and ability at their fingertips to be able to control their child's access to the internet. And you're right, it works better for younger, younger children, yeah. under 12, uh, but once someone becomes a teenager and is accessing this stuff and is curious and developing as an adult, at that point, parental controls, whilst still there and having a role to play, I would suggest having uh, a good relationship as a parent with your child is a much more important factor in that context. And so there I would, actually, I think I would disagree with you. Parents have always had difficult conversations with their children. It's just that changes from one generation to another. For this generation of parents, it, it means talking about internet pornography, as opposed to talking about Mayfair with my dad in the 1970s or 1980s, or whatever the equivalent might have been. That's not to trivialise it, to, again, use my the friend of mine who's a lawyer. He was literally stealing himself for that conversation with his 13-year-old son because he knows he's going to have to have it. But the point is that what he wants to say to his 13-year-old son is, don't think of this as being representative, don't think of this as real, all things in moderation. But he knows his 13-year-old son, 14-year-old son is going to find a way around to access this stuff. And what he wants to be able to do is when his son gets to 16, 17, 18, know this son's a well-balanced individual who has values, who's able to make his way in the world. And from the industry side, we're very keen on being able to do that. And the Oxford Internet Institute suggests that's the way things are going at the moment, and we'd endorse that approach. On the question around um, how do you let your parents know, tell your mum and dad to go to internetmatters.org. It's a very useful site in terms of information on there about uh, safety and making sure that those safety tools work correctly. And then finally, on the LGBT thing, if I found my nephew was speaking to somebody in an LGBT forum, I'd be delighted, because that means my nephew is thinking about his own sexual orientation or gender or whatever, and was wanting to have a conversation with someone who was clearly able to give him some guidance or thought or with whom he could share those experiences. So teenagers going off to find online forums is not necessarily a bad thing if those forums are they're seeking out deliberately in order to be able to talk about their own experiences in the world. So if I find a teenager going to an LGBT forum, that by itself would not be a bad thing. I would think that would be a good thing. Take the point, though, about self-harming forms. That probably wouldn't be such a good thing. But the point is, it's for teenagers to, as they develop, work those things through and be able to, in the context of a loving relationship with their parents, talk about what their experiences are and be able to have that relationship. I mean, Mark, you wanted to come in. So, so I think, you know, th I think some of the things that were mentioned was imply that kids are going to try and get round every parental control. You know, I think we have to remember that children go through various rites of passage. And when they're ready, as I remember as a boy, going and going around to my mate's house to look at a porn mag, that will happen at some point for most boys. Yeah. The bigger cons and it will happen probably, you know, in a much more there were a lot more stuff that they can go and see in the internet age. Whether you can restrict that or not, I don't know. My concern more is actually what us taking more time to think about the children before they hit those points. Most children aren't going around looking to try and you know either find a, a dodgy site. They're going around, they're Googling around their favorite brands. Even the, the, the safe search on all of these things aren't that secure. And if it flashes something up, you can't put that genie back in the bottle for a seven-year-old. And I think one of the things which we haven't really talked about is I suspect because of the availability, children are online at seven or eight. I suspect your, uh, your friend, the lawyer, 
you know, he's le left it too late if he's talking about this stuff yeah. at 13. <laughs> because he's talking about it publicly with me. I imagine yeah. he's been so, so having a separate conversation. So the issue is actually about what can we do for much younger kids who aren't that developmentally prepared for this stuff. And that's where I think we need to take a bit more of a, a, a step up. Parental controls for a 13-year-old, they'll get around it. Don't worry about it. OK. Um, Mark and then Rebecca. Just need to be a bit quick now. OK. okay. Um, so in case anybody thinks we're being sexist here, girls obviously do look... At, I mean, first magazine I ever saw, my sister called me into my mum and dad's room. <laughs> and said, look what I found I in the bottom drawer. I didn't, I didn't want to no, judge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only joking there, but, but I'm not... That was true, but I'm, I'm teasing you there. It was true. She was... Uh, um, <laughs> um, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> I've got a few other things to share as well. This idea of regulation is, is a really important thing because um, uh, Reg said uh, about the problem if parents think it absolves them, which is, which is a, um, you know, the parental controls um, idea. But I think that one of the problems I see is that we are encouraging the idea that, that there are some kind of technical ways that we can solve all these problems. Um, whether it's parental controls, whether it's the ISPs, whether it's regulation, whether we hand our children over to Tom Cruise in Moshi uh, and uh, to, to protect our kids or whatever. But we're imagining all the time that there are these technical uh, solutions and it kind of affects um, uh, our ability to, to judge, our ability to... To, to know what's right. It's a bit like, I think, that the real world, given that you mentioned the, the parks and everything, the real world kind of pa parallel is um, these signs that you see on parks that say uh, no unaccompanied adults allowed in. And, of course, the assumption then is that any accompanied adult is completely safe. Well, I'm not saying that there are people sneaking in and, and molesting children with another child in tow, but what I am saying is that by putting up that sign, you're then creating this idea that we can now all skip and slide and do all these things without even thinking. And so I think that's my fear, is that the regulation, regulatory approach, it kind of creates a tech-obsessed solution, which I think is kind of what you're getting at, you know, the, when you say that b bullying must be worse because it's online. We're, we're kind of getting obsessed with the technology as if it can... It, it causes problems, but somehow it's also going to solve every problem. Um, and, uh, and I think that's kind of dangerous. Thank you. Rebecca? I agree that um, technology is not the answer at all. It just helps a heck of a lot when you have 70,000 people a day coming through your site. But one of the things that I've noticed over the years is, and, and studied and, and actually have some numbers on is that 95% of people of all ages, but kids in particular, online behave great. And this is also pretty much true offline. 4% maybe have some issues and they're testing out the boundaries and we have to look at that 4% and make a judgment call. And 1% typically offline and online um, misbehave in such a way that they get permanently suspended or something happens to their account. In, in my experience at Moshi, it's about, it's less than a half a percent because we have had the luxury of setting the tone for Pop Jam and Moshi uh, at the beginning um, when we start building the, the um, community but the really the I think um, what Reg said is is in my experience I would agree is that it's about relationship so if you're if you're part of the at-risk group offline you're going to be part of the at-risk group online and you're going to go find the cutting forums I think it's irresponsible of of the site owners to leave those kind of forums up when they know they're up there that's just my own personal view but that becomes a bigger issue of freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think rela relationship is really at the bottom of everything, online and offline. Thanks. I'm going to get you all in now. You've got to be quick. So think Twitter, <laughs> not war and peace. I expect, like a few people here, I'm in education and I'm planning PSHE slots for my sixth form. And sometimes I think that the, the real world is actually the virtual world because uh, my students are a lot more honest with each other um, online. And when I try and plan sessions to really deal with pornography, and the issues it causes the relationship, my school says, no, no, we can't possibly deal with that. So it's a very difficult thing to parent as a teacher when I, uh, we're, the school is very squeamish <coughs> media-wise. And actually, I'm sure the parents would like me, and if I even sent a letter saying, I'm going to talk about pornography with your children, and we all have CEOP in, and, but actually, uh, the schools are extremely squeamish of having a bad headline, porn school. 
just a bit disappointed that um, the discussions just around bullying, sexing, sexting and child protection because there's far more and I like the, 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 to explore more the idea of the private public because what I see, my, my children, my daughters are in their mid-twenties and I use social media far more than they do and they tell me off for it and it's because you know, children will grow up but also in terms of the, uh, I think schooling is, is another hybrid between pri private and public and I find that with the, with the online, uh, with being online, um, I think adults in the family, parents, adults are interacting more positively. You know, my nieces and nephews are actually going to be always mindful. They might put something racist or rude, but then they'll know, you know, auntie will see it, or my, my daughter's in their 20s, and some friend might make a comment. I'll say, come on, watch it. My mother is reading this. So I actually think that it, there is a lot of positive, uh, especially, I, you know, from my my background, my culture, to me, so the social uh, world, so online world, is a bit like my neighborhood back in Beirut in the 1960s and 70s in Lebanon, when everybody was on the balconies and knew each other and, and adults interacted with children. Actually, I think it's really positive part of, of the uh, online world that this is the interaction between adults and children. Great point, thank you. Women over there talking about teaching PSHE lessons, I would say that even if your school did let you say, oh, have a session on porn, have a session on sexual health, other issues, the default filters would properly stop you from doing <laughs> that because you wouldn't be able to look up sites that have got like stuff around porn versus reality and sexual health and how to deal with self-harm. So that, that's a real responsibility for the ISPs to make sure that the kind of charity sector websites that are dealing with that stuff in a really responsible way that really empowers young people make sure that stuff is not blocked. There are many sites online like, uh, um, that are aimed at like teenagers on online dating, I guess. Um, they're called, one of them, is more prominent, is called mylol.com, and on it, it's lots of predators, and it's a very large problem on there, and I haven't really heard anything mentioned about helping protect against that sort of stuff. As a 16-year-old, I think that actually too much responsibility is sometimes put on parents for parental control. I know of people that until they were 15 actually had parental filters on the internet, and it stopped them, it restricted them from looking at websites that had words such as crap. And I personally think if you're restricted from that, that's it's no way in, like the child's fault. And I think maybe too much responsibility is given to the parents. I'm lucky enough to have had like liberal parents with my use on the internet, but it's I know from social networking, I've learned a lot that you are too um, embarrassed to ask your parents, maybe. And I think maybe too much. Do you? I want to know what you think about that. I do love the internet. I've just been counting, and I think I have six accounts. So I don't, I don't want to bash it. I think it can be a really great thing when it's used well. But I think it's quite terrifying that you can work out from algorithms what little children are feeling. And I think it's more terrifying that you need algorithms to know what they're feeling. I think that face-to-face -face contact is so, so important. And I think that if you actually do need to have worked out what percentage of children are upset when they type at this speed. That kind of complexity isn't really very useful. I think that, you know, they could be crying and still typing. You wouldn't know that. And I think that for children to have no reinforcement of whether the behaviour that they're exhibiting online is acceptable or not, because there's no face-to-face -face contact, that how are they supposed to learn? You know, life is a learning experience, but if you're not, if you don't know how you're making people feel, and a lot of people aren't sort of comfortable with articulating, that's not, that doesn't make me feel okay, stop saying it, because of the connotation that can have with being, you know, actually thinking that they're the ones bullying them, then how are they ever going to learn what, what's right in a relationship or not right? Digital footprint hasn't been mentioned here this this afternoon and for me that's the most concerning thing about presence online and it's not what they're doing online because I think as lots of people have said most students most young people are making good decisions online um, it's the interaction between the online world and then real life um, and how what they do impacts in real life and it's really interesting that in the new national curriculum for computing it's a sort of level six level seven Topic. So we're not expecting people to understand the impact of what they're doing online until they're perhaps in year eight or nine at secondary school, which I think is quite worrying. My dad works in e-safety and IT, so he's obviously gone through my computer and made sure everything's <laughs> safe. <laughs> but uh, from knowing that, I've got friends who have got completely no protection at all, so I know just what it can be like and how vulnerable they are. And it sums up that even with 
all my dad going through everything, I can still access stuff that I shouldn't be able to. And I, I know things pop up and you just can't stop things like that. And someone needs to put an, in effect something to filter better. Thank you. Thing. I'm really quite disturbed at the cosiness of this conversation. Um, we're, talking, we're talking about the internet that on, in general should not be too much regulated because it must remain free. We live in a society, however, which regulates the sale of cigarettes and alcohol and drugs and other things. We do live in an nanny state to an extent and we accept that. Why? Because there are vulnerable people out there. And Mark has put his finger on it. There are, vulnerable, there are a very large number of vulnerable people who are under 10. The idea that the internet service providers and the platform providers can simply walk away from a child protection policy, which is what, what seems to be being said today, is, is, is frankly really quite worrying. I would like to see the ISPs, I'd like to see the platform providers, I'd like to see the Googles of this world creating a very large fund which can be used for media education. Not, not for the middle class parents of the people in this room, but for the parents generally who are not only unable to deal with the tech, but are generally finding it very difficult to deal with parenting. And this is where the internet service providers could help out. They could step in and they could say, we will be part of the solution, not just to the problems people are facing on the internet, but to the problems they face in life generally, because we are awash with money and we're going to give some of it back. I just wanted to raise a point of the levels of anonymi anonymity. I can't say it still. Whenever we talk about social media, we're always mostly talking about Facebook, where it's your name right at the top. So whenever you're comparing that to real life, you know exactly who you're talking to. I've helped organise gaming communities when I was 14, which that was fun, but um, that's how I got into these things. But we, you take on a gamer tag, so you don't know who the person you're talking to is, but that provides you a forum that you don't need to worry about your everyday lives behind everything. You can go out and actually talk about things from a neutral perspective. And then you also have the further example where you then go into fully, anim an fully anonymous, sorry. <laughs> Anonymised. Yeah, that's it. Um, where you can literally discuss anything without worrying at all from the backlash. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed a bit more. There are a few challenges out there to the panel generally and to actually individuals around the ISPs, around the minority report <laughs> moment. If you could address that, that would be great. Well, I don't know how to put this, but I think we, just, we need to back off a bit from the kids' space. Um, uh, I think we need to stop wanting to police uh, everything that they do and we when I say we it's kind of uh, it's the society that Reg referred to it's but it's us as parents as well um, so I'm not blaming I've probably come across a bit uh, diff wrongly here I'm not blaming Moshi monsters and, and that for what they do they do what they do and they provide a service uh, but what I am asking is why do we want our kids uh, to be uh, to be going into this you know and, and there are elements here of safety you know we'd obviously most parents would nowadays seem to prefer to have their kids indoors rather than outdoors, so they kind of like the idea uh, that, that they're um, uh, being uh, looked after somehow. It's kind of like some kind of a digital crash or something. Um, and I think we are, we, we are strangely creating a society where somehow the value of expressing your identity, which has been mentioned quite a few times in different ways, is somehow the thing, the be-all and end-all. Um, and that we somehow must facilitate this. We must provide the kids with technology so that they can express their identity. So I think there's a couple of things there about the safety and the identity thing, which we kind of need to take a step back. Um, and the technology is secondary to that. Um, it will be regulated. The guy at the back's right. You know, the, there will be laws. The ISPs will step in. You know, I'm not imagining naively that I could somehow stop that. But I am kind of flagging up, you know, why do we think that this is somehow the most important thing that kids should have? Um, and maybe we should just say to them, maybe it's not the most important thing. Thank you. Rebecca. First, I wanted to address your point. It's proven that we've learned faster in groups and community through community peer pressure. And, and now with an online world of, of the world at your fingertips, we we can get information, learn more and do lots of positive things in, in big numbers. And that's the great thing about the, the net and interaction online, in my opinion. I think restrictions keep us all in the dark, and, and we know just from world politics that it's not a good thing. And just to sort of clear up this thing that's been completely blown out of proportion <laughs> about the minority report, we are not measuring typing speed or things like that for emotions. That was something that I said that we can tell as humans from doing this for so long. We can tell how, if we know each other, if we hit, build a relationship, we can tell how people are behaving with each other. 
um, it's a complicated system, but our, our actual moderation system, it's just numbers. If you're in a room with 500 people and they all like the color blue, you're gonna say 500 people in this room like the color blue and you're gonna hear it and everybody's gonna be talking about the color blue. I think um, and that's what we're doing. We're not, it's human generated information. It's not that we're looking to see how does this so-and-so feel today. We don't, we don't measure that. We're not interested in how somebody feels every second of the day. But we are interested in how often people are mistreated and, and what kind of mistreatment is happening and being able to label that so we can know, hey, 1% of our group is problematic. And so we're going to have to concentrate on that 1%. But we don't, we don't look at everything, as does Facebook and Google. And I'm sure everybody in this room, with maybe a few exceptions, use Google all day long and Facebook all day long and give them all kinds of private information that they actually do take and look at and, and decide what to do with. Predictive, everything's predictive on Google. So I don't think you need to be terrified about motion monsters. <laughs> all we're doing is making sure that people aren't <coughs> misbehaving or grooming young children. That's what we're looking at, not how somebody feels or what they eat for breakfast. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Daniel. I have to correct the misrepresentation that ISPs are walking away from child protection. The internet service providers have got together. They've invested 25 million in internetmatters.org. Each will have invested millions privately in terms of developing software that we talked about around parental controls. And the social media platform providers, Facebook and Twitter, even though they're a bit late to the game, are investing similar sums now in terms of how to have the right level of control on those social media platforms for parents to be able to use. So it would be quite unsafe to walking away from child protection. They, we take it very, very seriously, but the point is how to work in partnership with parents to give parents the ability to have the right kind of discussion with their children um, and understand the limited role that technology can play in that context, because otherwise you get into a conversation around policing the internet with a whole other discussion around what that might entail in terms of actual content on the internet. And that's a much broader question that's slightly beyond what we've had time to discuss today. So I'd emphasize that it really is in that sense about giving parents the control they need and the power they need. And so I really enjoyed the point that was made around uh, the sixth form school where you weren't able to have that conversation with the school. The point is you'd want the ISPs to allow the school, or not, not for the ISPs to allow it, the point is you'd want the school to be able to have that conversation with their children, with the kids they're teaching and their parents. And you want to have that openly so that you know that you're working collaboratively together to make sure that uh, as a parent, you're giving your child the best upbringing possible and, and using as many different uh, tools uh, as are available to have the right conversation with your kids about values and what, how we should understand the problems in society. And I think it's a real shame the school stepped away from the opportunity to have that conversation. So it's all, for me, it's all about making sure that uh, we give parents the tools they need, but also understand there is no substitution for good parenting. Ultimately, parents should be free to uh, get on with it and given all the tools and help they need to be able to have those conversations. So as the the person whose dad is an IT expert, don't you trust yourself? You sound like you're old enough now to trust yourself when it comes to using the internet. Thank you. Mark? Um, so, yes, the conversation has sort of sounded like it's gone who's for regulation and who's not for not for regulation. I personally wouldn't like to see regulation, but I think not having regulation means that the, the big companies have to step up and take a bit more self-responsibility. I disagree with Daniel that technology can't do very much. There are all sorts of things that technology can do. If, if you can create spiders that search the web to tell you what's in a website, you, can tell, you could use that same technology to search the web to tell you which websites have moderated web, moderated web pages, which ones don't have moderated web pages, which ones have uh, autonomous um, automatic adverts, which ones don't. There's all sorts of things, and the likes of... Uh, the, the big American companies, and it's good to hear the BT are in there. I think they could get together. 25 million is a good start. Make it a lot more. And do things like in the States, the Gates Foundation have uh, put a lot of money into a company, uh, an organisation called Common Sense, who have a wealth of information about, for parents to try and educate parents about what sites are actually doing. I'm part of the Children's Media Foundation. We'd love to do that sort of thing, but you know, the money has to be there from someone. It's not pitched for us, but someone needs to have the money to be able to do that at a mass scale. And I think the ISPs, the providers, uh, the search engines all need to get together and really take it seriously. Thank you, Mark. Reg, final, final, final. Final, final thoughts and last word. Yeah. I think it comes back to individuals and societies, you've heard. The interesting thing is the comment you made about sixth form being stopped by the school to do that has actually been overcome by mass uh, protest in a way. Uh, we as an organisation got all of our parents mobilised to bombard the DfE with changing 
the guidelines that went out on PHSE to include pornography. We, we hit the Daily Mail barrier of <laughs> Mother's Union wants porn sites. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, when you get over that... Now, Michael Gove was frenetically against that, didn't want the... He said that the guidelines were up to date because they'd been revised 13 years ago. Um, his successor, uh, Nicky Morgan, bless her, has, has changed it. So for, from the 1st of October, it became OK for schools to... The guidelines was changed on PHSE, so you can talk to your children about, or to, to the sixth form, and actually you can talk now even down to primary school age about the nature of, of an influence of pornography. Dates in October the 23rd, I've got my, my uh, dates planned, so thank you very much. Okay, but, you know, so, but that can be won by people sharing the values and saying go for it, which I think is, uh, is probably where I started from, saying this is about a societal responsibility. Okay, can we just thank our panel again for a very interesting discussion?